All right, this next video is going to be about temperament. And sometimes I have students coming to this class who haven't, uh, they're not familiar with that term. Uh, and so you may be familiar with the term personality. Uh, we are uh, in the class that I'm recording this for. We're going to have a chapter about personality. Um, but personality, those aspects of you or other people that uh, sets us apart, that gives us our individual differences. Um, personality is based on experience and things that happen to you combined with temperament. So what is temperament? Temperament is this part of personality, this component of personality that is innate or to a large part, uh, it comes from the person rather than the external environment. Um, you can see evidence for temperament in early infancy. Uh, some people will say you're born with a particular temperament. Some people will say, well, you know, you did, maybe not immediately in a newborn, but you can see aspects of temperament right away. Like if you've got a very fussy baby, that's an aspect of temperament. Uh, if you've got a very calm, chill baby, they'll be like, oh, hey, there's, there's some, some hints about temperament. I also see temperament discussed with like pets. Um, like uh, whenever I try to look up temperament resources for my research or for teaching other classes, it's always interesting how I'll find websites about like kitten temperament and puppy temperament. Also, when I got a kitten recently, uh, the one that's always interrupting the videos, there was this thing on TikTok. Uh, it was supposed to be a temperament test for kittens called the dangle test. You take your kitten and you kind of hold them under what we would call the armpits in a human. And, uh, and you kind of, you dangle them and you see if they, if they let you dangle them like that, if they just swing back and forth like a pendulum, that's supposed to mean that like they have, uh, a, that, that they have a good temperament. Um, my cat resisted a little bit and kind of put their legs up and I'm like, I don't care if they don't have the best temperament. I still love my kitten, All right? Just like with humans, there are certain types of temperament that might sound like they're better to have than others, but in the end, you, you, you can love somebody, you can like somebody, you can get along with somebody even if they don't have, you know, that optimal temperament. So let's talk about some of these types of temperament. Now, tricky thing with temperament you can either talk about temperament in terms of categories, like this person has this type of temperament, or you can talk about temperament in something we call a continual or continuum approach where we say, well, this particular characteristic, this person is high or medium or low in that particular characteristic. Now, the first people to study temperament use the categorical approach. And your book, uh, the book that I'm using for teaching intro psych right now, they just go over that one first classic study on temperament that did use a categorical approach. So if you go on to take further human development classes, uh, like developmental psychology or psychology of infancy and childhood on my campus where I'm teaching, um, you're going to learn more about temperament. You're going to learn about how there's all these different ways that people study temperament. We're going to focus on the first study, the first way it was done. And that study was conducted by Thomas and Chess and some articles, they will list them as Chess and Thomas, but those are the researchers, Thomas and Chess, uh, and they conducted a study called the New York Longitudinal Study. You might remember from earlier in the chapter, what is a longitudinal study? That's when you follow folks over time, and they are studying infants, and they uh, classified infants on uh, nine characteristics, and based on those nine characteristics, they put them into categories. They had three, three categories. Later, they had to add a fourth category. It's kind of a trend in human development stuff. We start with one, one amount of categories, and then we'll add another one later. But originally, there, there were three. So the first category is called easy temperament. What does it mean to have an easy temperament? Uh, these individuals are they're relatively calm. They are adaptable. They do not have a lot of sleeping and eating problems. They uh, react uh, well to change and they don't they're not easily frustrated all right so I always think you know these are kind of like your chill infants things don't seem to upset them uh, being moved from one person to the other they handle that well um, uh, that you know that it's time time for them to take the nap they take their nap time to introduce a new food they just eat it you know those are the th sorts of things that you might see with an easy temperament baby all right People often talk about that one like that's the one you want. Those are the ones that are easy to parent. 
I wouldn't know. I've never had an easy temperament baby. And my mom made it very clear to me I was not an easy temperament baby. So what are the other two? What are the other two original categories? The next one, I hate the name of it, but the next one is called difficult temperament. Doesn't that sound judgmental? Maybe it's just me because I know darn well I probably would have been classified as having a difficult temperament. And at least one of my children had a difficult temperament. All right, so a difficult temperament. This involves having sleeping and eating difficulties, uh, uh, being easily frustrated, not reacting well to change. All right, these are the babies, you know, they're fussy. They are fussy, they are easily upset. All right. Um, that's the type I was, the type at least one of my, one of my children were. All right, so you got some fussy, fussy babies out in the world. All right, and that, over time, your temperament combines with en uh, environment experience and it shapes your personality. Somebody with like a difficult temperament, they might end up being a more, you know, neurotic, tense adult, which I would say that I am. Um, what's the third one? What's the other one? This one's a little different. Um, you know, you've got easy and difficult, which almost sound like opposites of each other. Slow to warm up. Slow to warm up. That really its central characteristic is how they react to new situations, to change. Um, they need time. They need repeated exposure to warm up to new experiences, new people. That's why it's called slow to warm up. They can adjust to change, but they need time. They need their time to warm up. You know, I always, I always think of sort of adult examples of slow to warm up behavior. A lot of people will know that one person that when you first met them, they were really quiet and you wondered if they even liked you or if they liked people or maybe they were rude, maybe they were super shy. And then they got used to the circle of friends or the classmates. And then they start talking, they start warming up. And then you're like, oh wow, how did I ever think they were quiet? They, this person is full of life. How did I ever think that? They had to get used to you, they had to warm up. You know, with an infant, this could look like you present a new toy to them that they've never seen before. And at first they're looking at it like, I don't trust that, I don't know. They have to take time to, you know, approach it and you know, poke at it and be like, maybe it's okay. And then, you know, whereas, the child with the easy temperament, they might just go right up to this new thing right away, check it out, explore it, all right? The slow to warm up child, they need more time to warm up. They also do have some frustration. They will, uh, they're, not, they're not as easily frustrated as a difficult uh, temperament baby, but they do have some reactions to frustration. And with sleeping and eating, actually, let me check that in my notes. Slow to warm up, they have generally regular uh, sleeping and eating patterns. I mean, it's not, it doesn't define them, certainly. All right, so you think easy, chill, calm, adapts easily. Difficult, easily upset, sensitive. Let's think of them as sensitive. Slow to warm up, they need time to adjust to new situations. There's no way around it. It's part of their temperament. All right, we think that a lot of temperament is probably biologically or genetically influenced. You know, that individual that's slow to warm up, for example, you can't just tell them to shut it off. Like, get over it and adjust to the new things. They're like, no, I'm always going to be like this. This is the way I am. I need time to adjust to new things. Someone with a difficult temperament, you can't just tell them, why can't you be more calm? They're going to be like, how? <laughs> Aspects of my biology tell me I should be frustrated very easily. All right. So, um... With temperament, it does combine with the environment and like, you know, the way adults like parents interact with the child. Um, and I, I talk in more detail about that in other, other developmental psych or human development classes. Uh, temperament doesn't operate in isolation. Uh, it does combine with exper experience and parenting and the way like other adults, like teachers, treat a child. But temperament on its own is a powerful influence on the ultimate personality of an individual. All right, adding on to the video about temperament, I mentioned that there were three categories and then we added a fourth one. I forgot to mention the fourth one. Uh, the fourth one that was added later is unclassified. Um, there were a lot of infants 
uh, that just they couldn't fit into one of the three categories so they had to call them unclassified and this is actually a criticism of the Thomas and Chess categorical type of approach to temperament um, the second largest category in their original sample was unclassified so that's actually a problem it was actually pretty I think I want to say it was like 30%, maybe 35%, but a, a pretty decent number of those, those infants in the original sample, they were unclassified. So that's the fourth category. You can't put them into a category, they get in this fourth category.